The Wood Whisperer is sponsored by Powermatic, the gold standard since 1921. Now I know this may seem a little bit out of order. The piece isn't completely assembled yet and we're going to start talking about finishing. But really, with a lot of pieces of furniture that I've built in the past, finishing kind of comes and goes at different points in the project. It's not always uh, simply mill, build, glue together, uh, and then finish. It just sometimes makes a lot more sense to do the finishing before you're done with the project because it just makes your life a whole lot easier. For instance, finishing the inside of this cabinet is going to be a lot harder when we've got a set of doors on the front, when we've got the top in there and we're trying to finish the underside. It's going to be a mess. Uh, what I like to do is now that most of the uh, cabinet is pre-assembled and a lot of these joints are sealed off, now's a good time to actually start applying some finish. While we have all this room to work, uh, if we don't do that, like I said, it's really going to be a bear to try and get uh, all these surfaces covered and finished. Now you could even do this one step before. You could have everything pre-finished before we even do this part of the glue up, but I like to have at least most of the uh, joints protected from our finish before I even go into this. Uh, and the other thing is the front doors, the sliding doors, well, they need to be mobile. And if you start applying finish to that surface, the finish is probably going to drip down into the channel that we've cut here. And it's going to just make it a, a lot harder for that door to slide. And I just can't imagine us getting a really good quality finish on those doors. So uh, the first thing we're going to do is apply a wiping varnish. It's a very simple finish. In fact, it's one of my favorite finishes because it's simple and it's protective. It doesn't really need to be a complicated process. And we'll go into those details in a second. But first, I want to talk a little bit about trim and plywood. Okay, solid wood trim sometimes doesn't match up uh, with the color of the plywood. And sometimes they also will not uh, look the same after finish hits them because the finish absorbs differently uh, in a very thin veneer than it does in a full piece of solid wood. So this is just a sample board that I've made up with a nice strip. In fact, it's exactly like our partitions here. Now, the side that I'm considering the show side of this piece looks like this, and that's a pretty good match. And chances are when we put finish on there, it's going to look just as good. Uh, I don't think this needs any more work, but you might be in a situation, and this goes with any wood, doesn't have to be walnut, where you can see that trim, and you have to decide whether you want to do something about that. A lot of people don't mind, you know, so if you don't want to do anything, you don't necessarily have to. Uh, but the easiest way I find to uh, combat this problem is to use uh, some type of a stain on top. Now, it's a beautiful walnut surface, so it's really a shame to have to use stain on there. But if it's an imperfect walnut surface and you want a really consistent look over the entire surface, staining may be just the way to go. So I have some water-based stain here. This is the same stain that I used on the... Uh, the off material on the back panels. It's a general finishes, walnut, water-based wood stain. Okay, so let me show you how that process goes. So the first thing you want to do, is spray some distilled water over the whole surface. Because we're using a water-based um, stain, that water-based stain is going to raise the grain. So what we're doing now is pre-raising the grain. Let's give it a good coat. Wipe off the excess and let that dry for about an hour. And once it's nice and dry, I can come back, give it a very light sanding just to knock off the uh, raised grain. Doesn't need much. And now we can start with the stain. And before I use a water-based stain, I like to sprinkle the surface with a little bit of water just to sort of pre-soak the grain a little bit so the stain doesn't absorb unevenly. Now these water-based stains, they usually go on pretty dark and then they dry to a sort of dull color. But that's okay, because as soon as they get finish on them, they'll go right back. Now you can see already how much better blended uh, that stripe is. 
come back with a relatively clean, clean rag here. Get that excess off. Now by the time this dries and we get a coat of finish on here, it's going to look 10 times better than it did before. But again, I don't really know that I'm going to do this process on our piece here because most of the uh, exposed areas are pretty well blended to begin with. But it's good to know that you've got this in your tool bag of tricks in case you do have an uneven color situation. All right, so here's the game plan. I really only want to apply finish to the interior parts, the stuff that's going to be hard for me to reach later. So the outside piece of trim, the top side over here, I don't really want to hit those just yet. I want to address those when the whole piece is together. Um, you know, especially if I'm putting finish on the top, it may have a tendency to drip down the edge. So I want to make sure I'm doing that all in one shot. But everything else is going to get coated now, uh, including the doors, as well as the shelves, the back panels, everything, but those top surfaces and the trim. So what I'm going to use is a wiping varnish. Um, this is already diluted to a wiping formula, so it's been diluted with mineral spirits. But really, if you want to make your own, it's nothing more than uh, polyurethane diluted about 50% with mineral spirits. And just get a secondary container like this, mix your own, just make sure it's uh, uh, mixed thoroughly, and you should have it at the point that it's a wiping formula. And that basically means no brushes, um, no brush strokes when it's all said and done. You just use rags to apply the finish. Now the first coat, you know, there's really no points for neatness. The wood is very thirsty for finish at this point and it's gonna absorb it pretty quickly. So I really just slap it on, wipe off the excess, and then let it dry six to eight hours. Uh, after that point, you really do start to build a film. So you have to be much more careful about your, uh, the way that you apply it. So it's nice, smooth, even strokes with the grain. But right now, we're gonna be a little bit sloppier than normal. Uh, the way I usually like to do this is put the finish into a secondary container. If you keep opening this can, and putting a dirty rag back into it, of course, you're gonna contaminate the finish. Uh, the other thing is we're not gonna use all this in one shot. So if we keep that lid off, the longer that's off, the longer that finish is exposed to oxygen. And that is how this stuff cures, is by oxidation. So the less time this can is open, the better. So I usually will start by uh, opening up the can, pouring out just what I need for this project. should be plenty to get me through the first coat. And if you have a lid for something like this, you just put the lid on and uh, continue for the second coat using the same batch. So like I said, no points for neatness here. I just want to get the finish in and get that first coat soaked into the wood. This is usually my favorite part of a project when you really see the wood just come to life like that. It's gorgeous. Now, you do want to take special care to avoid getting finish on the uh, exposed parts of the joinery here. And it probably wouldn't be a bad idea to mask them off uh, with some masking tape if you want to take the time to do that. Um, but at this point, I have pretty good faith that we'll be able to control uh, where the finish actually ends up. Nice. OK, I will continue across the entire piece and again, try to avoid getting finish on the trim. And uh, we're cruising right along. This is turning out really nice. Now, finishing the inside of what's uh, going to be the bottom piece, it's a little bit trickier to keep the finish out of these, uh, the grooves and dados. So what I'm going to do is use some tape here and just put a strip in each one. Now it's not perfect, you still need to be careful, but it's certainly better than having nothing at all in there. It's basically, basically just uh, push it all the way down until it hugs the sides. And 
that should do a pretty fine job. Now our second coat of wiping varnish is going to require a little bit more care and attention than the first. Uh, you see at this point we're starting to build a film. Uh, the wood is pretty much sealed. It's not going to suck that much more in. The finish is going to start layering on the surface and now uh, minor imperfections in the way that we apply this stuff can be a lot more visible at this point. So what I like to do is make a nice thick pad of clean cotton rags. This is just old t-shirt material. Uh, and honestly, older the better, because uh, the more this is run through the washing machine, the less lint uh, and the better it's going to be for the process of finishing. So I've got a nice little pad here, and I sort of just hold it in my hand like this, dip it into the finish, much like we did before, but like I said, this time, smooth strokes and a nice even layer all the way across. Just keep moving down the line. Now, although we're working on the inside of the case right now, I will use this exact same process for every other part of the project, including the top, the shelves, the doors, everything. Now, before you apply your third coat of wiping varnish, do yourself a favor. Feel the surface. Once it's fully dry, just rub your hands all over it what you're going to feel is a rough texture, okay? Uh, the grain is raised, there are some, probably some things that were in the finish that dried on the surface. And what we need to do, the real secret to a fine finish, we need to sand that material down. So what I like to do is use 320 grit paper. This happens to be a wet dry paper, but you can use regular. Uh, and at this point, just very lightly abrade the surface. We don't want to sand through the finish. We just want to smooth it out. Now, we, we couldn't do this before because with a wiping varnish, you don't really apply much varnish with each coat, and that's one of the great things about it. But if you sand too soon, you're going to sand back down to bare wood. So notice, just a very light touch. And how do you know when you've gone far enough? That's what your other hand is for. When it's nice and smooth, and you'll feel a tremendous difference between the areas that you've smoothed and the ones that you haven't. Okay, so once you sand the entire project down, come back with a clean rag soaked in mineral spirits and just wipe that dust right off. Let that dry and then you can go on to your third coat of uh, wiping varnish. Now keep in mind, the great thing about wiping varnish is that each of those coats is so thin that you can decide exactly where you want to stop, depending on the look and the feel that you want. So if you want to build up a really thick film, you may need to go seven, maybe even eight coats, as, as much as eight is kind of excessive, but if you're looking to get that brushed on type look where it's a nice thick coat, that may be the way to go. If you really want that thick of a finish, you may consider a different application method and using a stronger solution anyway. But with a wiping varnish, what I like to do is more of a close to the wood finish that still gives you the protection of varnish, but when you touch it, it doesn't feel like you're touching plastic. And on an open poured wood, something like walnut where you could see that pore structure, it's really a good idea to stick with that lighter type of finish because if you put a really, really thick film finish on walnut, especially if it's a really high gloss, it can look a little bit funny if you see those little pits and things in there. So um, I'm probably going to go with a total of maybe four, five at the most coats. But the idea is from now on, we will lightly sand in between each coat. Okay, so we start with 320. After the next coat, I'll probably, I'll probably move up to 600 grit and continue using 600 grit between each coat from here on out. And again, stop when you think it looks good. Now after your final coat, once, once you have the finish you're looking for, the film thickness, uh, and the appearance that you're looking for, run your hand over the whole surface and you may feel just a little bit of grit here and there, just little nubs of uh, dust or something that's stuck onto the surface. And what I like to do for that, just for that final smoothing, is I take a piece of 2000 grit automotive wet dry sandpaper. It's usually this black or, or gray stuff. And very, very lightly, I just sort of graze the surface across. A lot of folks say you can use brown paper from a brown paper bag to do this as well. I've never really done that, uh, but if I didn't have any paper on hand, 2000 grit, that's what I would do. 
Okay, so this light action across the whole surface like this really will knock down those high spots without actually creating much in the way of dust or anything on the surface. It doesn't really scratch the surface. It just kind of lightly buffs it in a way. So go over any spot that you feel with your uh, bare hands, you feel has a little bit of grit. There's one right there. And that usually takes care of it. Now before we do the final glue up and close everything in, it's not a bad idea to think about your shelf pinholes. Now, if you don't have what I've got here, which is a little aftermarket jig, uh, you may consider putting these holes in before this step while all the pieces are, are separated and you have access uh, to all the pieces being nice and flat on a work surface, depending on how you want to do it. For me, with this aftermarket jig, I just find it easier to wait till the piece is together. As long as I've got enough room to fit my drill in that location, I like to reference off of the bottom uh, of the workpiece like this, and it works really well for me. So just think ahead of time on how you want to approach the shelf pin holes. Uh, but what I'm going to do, like I said, is use this commercial jig, and it has a spring-loaded drill bit that basically drills the perfect depth hole each and every time. Uh, and all you really need to, uh, to operate it is a drill. So what's a reasonable alternative to a commercial jig like this? Well, you could certainly make your own, but uh, I find the easiest thing to do is just use pegboard. It's widely available at any home store. Just cut it to the size that you need, and you've got your holes spaced perfectly about an inch apart. You can't beat it. Now, we haven't talked much yet about the shelves. Each compartment gets two shelves, and they're going to be adjustable, uh, so that's a total of six overall. Now, the shelves are going to be essentially constructed in exactly the same way as the partition pieces and the side pieces. It'll be a uh, simple piece of ply that fits into the compartment, and you could dress up the front. In fact, you could dress up all four edges if you really want to, but uh, the front is really all that's ever going to be seen. So as I was looking around the shop trying to find some scrap material uh, that would be great to use for the edge banding on this, I came across some of my cutoffs from uh, cutting the trim on the top and bottom pieces, and I realized that these cutoffs have a little bit of an angle in them, and clearly, because that's how we cut it, and I'm like, you know, this actually might make really cool edge banding. Imagine if the shelves also mimic the same slope that you see in the top and the bottom trim. And on this, you know, little tiny piece of wood, it's very slight, so it's not going to be overbearing in any way. So that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to actually use this material as my edge banding to give the shelves themselves uh, just an interesting detail uh, that'll be a surprise for anyone who decides to open the door and take a close look at that shelf. Um, those little details are the things that make custom furniture so fun, you know? You wouldn't see that necessarily in a manufactured product. So uh, applying that is going to be exactly the same way as before. Uh, I'm really just going to use tape this time because of the angle. I don't really want to mess around with the uh, clamping and just uh, trying to make a, you know, a clamping call that has the appropriate angle in it. Tape will be more than adequate for gluing this together. Finally, we're ready to attach the bottom. So we're going to start by putting glue and all the dados. And if you have a helper, this is the time to get them because they're going to need to move fast to get everything in position. And you'll see what we mean in a second. So let's start by adding the glue. Now, as you can see, even with two people, we're running around like chickens with our heads cut off trying to get this thing to be positioned right. Uh, after it's been sitting here for a day or two, things have moved a little bit. So even when we did our dry fit before, well, you know, things have changed since then. So uh, it takes a little bit more coercion and that's where slow setting glues can come in handy if you're not uh, able to get it done quick enough by yourself. Uh, it's, a good, it's a good insurance policy to use a slow setting glue, but I, I knew we've done this enough times, I knew we'd be able to get it, so I used standard PVA glue. Um, when you put everything together now, since these uh, surfaces are finished, you want to be very careful and make sure that if you get glue squeezed out that you go back and clean it up with a damp rag so it doesn't harden and cause you a problem later on. Um, mine came out pretty good. I've got a little bit of squeeze out over here that I need to take care of. That's why I've got this. 
Uh, but for the most part, it's secure, it's in the clamps. We might add a few more clamps here and there. Um, and I think we're uh, pretty excited about the project at this point. It's starting to look good.